So when I said, who's the, bearing in mind all of the managers that you've played for, I said, who's the best manager? Because we're going to try and talk a little bit about what we can learn from managers. You said Graham Taylor. Why was that? It's very easy to continue success. When Kenny Dalglish used to call with Liverpool, they were the best team in the country. Mm. But to start it, so that's why I said the best manager, in my opinion, for Liverpool ever is Bill Shankly. Jurgen has been fantastic in terms of what he's done, but Liverpool were still a top four club when he took over. From Bill Shankly to take Liverpool from the second division to create this dynasty, Bob Paisley was much more successful, won much more than him, trophies. Bill Shankly never won the European Cup, never played in it, but he started it. Now, Graham Taylor took Watford from the fourth division to the top division. We finished second to Liverpool, got to the FA Cup final, lost to Everton. We then played in the quarterfinals of the UEFA Cup, because we finished second in the league. You finish second in the league, you go to the Champions League. So what, and 80% and of those players came from the fourth division. I was an 18, 19 year old, we had a couple of other 18 year olds. But 80% of those players who finished second in the league came from the fourth division. Now how can a manager inspire, organize, make a culture for a team of fourth division players to finish second in the league? Because Graham Taylor spoke about the togetherness, the spirit. Yes, you have to have individual quality, don't get me wrong, but it's much more when you talk about it from a team perspective. What can we do as a team? And we were talking about it earlier. So Graham Taylor couldn't handle Gaza, Gary Lineker, these so-called players who may feel they're better than their teammates or superstars. Because he believes that in a team, you're only as good as your weakest member. And there are no such thing as weakest members. Because even if you look at football now, and we like to talk about, and in football in the last 20 years, what has become apparent is the individual aspect of football. So we put our teammates, and it's not just now, let's talk about Liverpool in the old days. We had Gerard and Suarez. And what we did is we put them above their teammates. And once you start putting players above their teammates, particularly from the fans' perspective, those superstar players are not, are not responsible for failure. So if Harry Kane scores three goals and Tottenham lose 4-3, Harry Kane is not responsible for the failure. But he is, because he's part of the team that has lost. But unfortunately, because we've put these players, individual players, above their teammates, that has, that, that's a recipe for disaster. Because how often have we seen in football, where in an interview after, even the superstar players themselves, and I've seen this, which is the most disrespectful thing you can ever hear, players go, we need better players. And if you want me to stay, we've got to sign better players. And the fans and the press go, yeah, we have to sign better players to keep whoever happy. Now, the club has been around for 100 years. You've had superstars for the last 100 years. This is a real modern thing. In the past, and I'll use Liverpool as an example, when Kenny Dalglish and Ian Rush were the, 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 the main players in the 80s, there is no way that Kenny Dalglish or Ian Rush could ever say that if they've lost that, oh, um, you know, we need to get better players. Because, A, they're talking about their teammates. And when the teammates see that, be it Sammy Lee and the so-called lesser teammates as much as none, they're talking about, you want to replace me and I'm your teammate. They would not put up with it, the fans wouldn't put up with it, the manager wouldn't put up with it. Whereas now we're pandering to the individual superstar player. And that is why you look at clubs and you look at the best managers, you look at the best managers and the best clubs, they're the ones who have the power Meaning, at Arsenal, Arteta fell out with Aubameyang. Aubameyang fell out with two, three managers before. Who got the sack? The managers. When Arteta fell out with Aubameyang, Arteta won that battle. Look at Arsenal now. Because the other players see that, and the other players go, you are the man in charge. When you say jump, we have to jump. And you look at the managers who have been successful in the last four or five years. Guardiola, he fell out with players at Manchester City. Klopp like with Daniel Scherzer and a few players, and if they give the manager the power to make those decisions, then that's a recipe for success. Arteta had it. That's why I'm surprised Chelsea actually stacked Tuchel. So that, why I say Graham Taylor was the best manager is because he formulated a strategy which meant that you don't necessarily need to have the best players in it. And if, if it be it business, be it if you, if you have a way of playing, you have a way of running a business, you can pick good, competent people to fit into what you actually believe in. But first of all, you have to have that vision. So what comes first? I'll use a football analogy. What comes first, the players or the vision? So with Manchester City, with Klopp, now with Arsenal, they have a vision of how they want to play, and they pick individuals to fit that vision. Most people say, let's get the best players. Let's sign, like Chelsea have 800 million in the last, I don't know, year, signing all these players. But unless they have that vision of how they want the team to operate, it won't work. It won't work. So for me, the vision is the most important thing. And ultimately, you don't need to have the greatest players. You just have to have the best way of playing. And the best way of playing, and there's no such thing as the best way of playing, is where everybody within that team and with that framework understands it. Because Manchester City play a completely different way to Liverpool. Now you say, which way is better? Some people may like Liverpool's all-pressing, aggressive style. Some people may like Man City's way. The most important thing is for those 11 players from Manchester City, 
to understand how Manchester City play. <coughs> Those 11 players from Liverpool understand how Liverpool play. Now, because Jordan Henderson in the last few years have done so well for Manchester City, so for Liverpool, it doesn't mean that he can go and play for Manchester City because he won't fit into that style. Kevin De Bruyne would not suit Liverpool's style. But unfortunately, what football clubs do is they see a great player doing well at his club and they think, well, we should sign him. But if it doesn't fit into your philosophy and your template of how you want to play, it, it isn't going to work. And that's where the good managers, first of all, talk about how do we want our team to operate? How do you want your company to operate? And then they fit people to fit into that. Secondly, the character is so important. The character of the people in your organization. Because what will happen as it happens in football is that in every organization, every football team, there's going to be perceptions of individuals being better than others or more important than others. So, is Mo Salah more important than, I won't say Trent because he's a bit of a superstar now, but Andy Robertson? The fans will always put players ahead of each other, so the fans may say that. The fans may always put players ahead. Harry Kane's more important than, than Eric Dyer. That's okay for the fans to see that way. Harry Kane can't see it that way. He has to have the reverence and the respect that he is as necessary and, as, and of course, they like me because I'm going to score goals, but he's equally as valuable. And as long as the players don't see themselves more important than their teammates, and in business it's exactly the same thing. My son's a banker, he's a trader, and of course what happened many years ago with Nick Leeson and stuff, they were putting these traders above everybody else and making them feel more important. But you're not more important. And a Liverpool's philosophy from Bill Shankly's time of a family is talking about not just the team, not just the superstars in the team in their relation with, relationship with the other players, but the players with the substitutes, the players with the fans, the fans with the community. And just to give you an example before I let you go on, because there's this big debate about Messi and Ronaldo, and we all have an opinion, and my opinion is not based on who's a better footballer, because they're both equally as good. We have an opinion as the type of player we like, but one of them is more respectful to the culture of football and his club and his teammates, and he doesn't put himself above his teammates. When he scores a goal, he doesn't go into his own, and I suppose, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> and then one of them went to Manchester United, and what happened is they put him above his teammates. And in many respects, you can put him above his teammates if he's 25 years old scoring all those goals. You put him above his teammates, he then stifles the rest of the team. He stifles the rest of the team. Jaden Sancho, 80 million. You haven't seen Jaden Sancho because it's all about Ronaldo, these other players. All of a sudden, Ronaldo goes, and look what happens to Man United. The team is now a much better team. So, from Graham Taylor's time, as much as people may look at me as an individual player, I always recognize my responsibility to the team first and foremost. I played on the left wing for Watford. I was an attacking player. My first responsibility, my first responsibility was to track back the fullback when he went. People wouldn't think that. They'd think, yeah, you're going to score goals, go down the wing, put crosses in. Graham Taylor says, yes, you're going to do that. But your first responsibility is that if your fullback runs, you chase him back. So therefore, the team ethic and the team responsibility, and that's not just in football, that's in life. You talk about your family. I'll talk about my kids and my family. And I say to my kids all the time, we can't have a happy family if, and I've got seven kids, three grandkids, lots of them. I said, we can't have a happy family if one of the family is unhappy. And that's what happens in football. That's what happens in the community. That's what happens in, in business. Everybody has to be on the same page. But I remember you as a, as a, as a kid, fast and goals and... Like, you were, the, for me, the inspiration, probably the reason I got into and fell in love with football. And I always had a vision of you as a kid as, like, this brilliant individual player. And watching you now, I see somebody genuinely in love with the team and the, and the culture and the, the sort of the importance of the, the unit, if you like, that I, I, didn't, I didn't grasp back then. That no, because what happens is you see the highlights. Yeah. Because, of course, you'll see me when I'm scoring goals up in the ball, but, but for the other... Because, you know, highlights of football matches. If I score, even if you score a hat-trick, no matter what you do in a football match, all your highlights in scoring three goals and beating five players in a 90-minute match is about five minutes. What are you doing for the other 85 minutes? And the other 85 minutes is when you are working for the team. But people don't see that. So where did, where did that... I'm going to dive into Graham Taylor a bit more, but where did that... Was that instilled in you by your family? Or was that something that, that, that you... Uh, was you, your parents, perhaps? Well, my father was a, a colonel in, in, in the army. He, he came as a military attaché, so he was a diplomat. So he came to England... <clears throat> um, when I was 13 years old because he was sent to England as a military attaché. So he was a diplomat, a diplomatic status. Um, and my dad uh, instilled that in me in terms of discipline to the team. Because when you're an army officer, when you're an army officer, it's all about the team. So just to give you an example, my dad says, whatever you're going to do, you've got to do with authenticity. You've got to do it with discipline, determination, authenticity. authenticity. My sister swam for Jamaica. I used to swim competitively from when I was seven and I retired when I was 12. And I'll tell you why I retired. 
We used to swim in the National Stadium in Jamaica, and we used to go to the National Stadium to train every day. I'm now seven, eight, nine, ten. When I got to ten, and I've always played football since I was young, and we had to train every day. We got there, one or two days I'd stop to play football instead of going to training. When I was 12, my dad said, if you're not going to go to swimming training every day, stop swimming. If you're going to do it, you do it properly. So I've come to England now at 13, the home of football. I love football. My dad played football for Jamaica, not professionally because he's a colonel in the army, but we played professionally. Sorry, not professionally, but he played for Jamaica. I've now come to England. I go to this club here in Paddington. A boy, I went to a rugby school, so my school didn't play football. Sorry, so I, went, I played only rugby at school. But I played for a club, Store Boys Club in Paddington. In Jamaica, when I was 11, I was playing for the under 16s at school. I was always a good player. I was always the player I was. I'm an attacking player, I'm a skillful player. I'm playing on the wing, I'm playing up front, I'm an attacking midfield player. My whole life from seven, I get to the Stowe Boys Club at 12, which is a great boys club. We're beating everyone 10 nil. So when I've joined, because it's such a fantastic club with great players, no one wants to play at the back. As you know, with youngsters, they want to score goals. So I played as a centre back for five years. So between the ages of 13 when I came until 17 when I signed for Watford, I played as a centre-back. Because my dad said, no one wants to play there. The team is the most important thing. You're going to play at the back. And I felt, and I, I was happy to do so. I was never a centre-back. But playing in schoolboy football at a centre-back, I could do it. But of course, when I then went to Watford, because they saw me playing, they know as a 16, 17-year-old, I'm not good enough to be a centre-back in, in, in playing for Watford in the top division. So therefore, they knew I could play, so I went on the left wing. But the point I'm trying to make is that for the five years I played in for Stowe Boys Club, and as much as I was never a centre-back, and in training and people see me play, they know I'm a skillful player, although I'm playing at the back, it was because of the responsibility to the team that my dad said, the responsibility for the team, that is where you're going to play, and I was happy to do it. And Graham Taylor then, when I went to Graham Taylor, and he spoke about the responsibility for the team, it was just natural for me to do it. So that's my follow-up question. Bearing in mind, business owners, we have to employ people. Can you develop this, or is this something that we have to find in somebody and bring it out like do you, do you think that as a in, in a football team for example if i'm trying to instill that in you and somebody's parents hasn't given you that can i can i find it in you or is it just not there well it depends on the age doesn't it because of course the formative years are very important unfortunately for me as i grew up from i'm six seven eight nine ten this is where i've been brought up you bring me on up as an army child and, and by an army officer you know when he says you do this you do this and as much as when my dad were telling, he was telling me things like this when I was young about my friends used to go out, and we lived in London, going out to nightclubs and stuff, and he goes, you, and I hated it because I wanted to do that. But because he drilled it into me, I did it as more, more second nature. Then when I got old enough to realize that it was the right thing to do, I was fortunate that this is where I've been brought up. So it really does depend, A, on the in individual, but also, uh, I remember, and, and to talk about football management and to give a similar analogy in football management, you get to a particular time and nothing's going to change you because there's so many managers and as a young manager a lot of the young managers and you see they have problem players at clubs and you've now got a job as, an, as a manager your first job your second job you're young you see a fantastic player somewhere else and you think and you've heard he's got a bad character but you think oh no look how good he is look how good he is i can change him i can change him you speak to alex ferguson and and and, and, and experienced managers and they'll tell you he's the best player in the world he's now 25 years old He's been a problem, and he's still a problem at 25. You're not going to change him. You're not going to change him. And Man United have Ravel Morrison. I don't remember Ravel Morrison. He's now playing for Jamaica. He's playing in Turkey. I don't know where he is. And from he was 16, he was an unbelievable footballer. And Fergie was like, okay, we can work him. He's only 16. He's got a bad attitude, but that's okay. He gets 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, and he thinks, and now he's 30 with the same attitude. So can you change yes but you then get to a particular point in time when you have to make that decision as to whether you think they can and if they're a particular age and i know so many footballers who have been lost in the game of football because or a lot of managers who've lost their jobs because with our egos as managers it's like so typical example people say to me gaza should have gone to manchester united yes. he would have changed him fergie would have been dead by now yes. i'm telling you you can change Paul Gascoigne from he was 10, 11, 12 years old, let me tell you. So it's not about, you know, uh, and Gaza's unique. When I say you can change, because Gaza's had issues since he's been 8 and 9 and 10. Um, but no, you get to a particular point, no matter how good they are in the organization as a footballer, and you know that they're not going to change. Because I think the problem we have, and it'll be in my business and here, we get employees and they might be not a cultural fit, but they're a star in terms of the physio and the, the phrase we might use is a pain in the ass, a rock star, somebody that wants to steal the show. And we always think we can change them. And it, and it like just destroys the culture. And the, 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 the problem for these guys and, and myself, healthcare, 
you always want to give people a chance and you yeah. always want to give them another chance and you always think that they'll, they'll turn around next week but they never do you see I'll use Gaffer as an example with Terry Venables you see because Terry understood that's why Graham Taylor couldn't handle him Bobby Robson couldn't handle him Alex Ferguson certainly wouldn't be able to handle him because you can't tell Gaza to do it. You've got to, and Terry Venables would allow him to do things yeah, and get away with the most ridiculous things and as much as he got the best out of Gaza and Gaza played really well on the table they loved him and the other players were quite happy for Gaza to do that they never won anything. So when Gaza was at Tottenham, the best time of his career, that's where he became a superstar, Tottenham won nothing. Mm. So, but Terry Venables understood that without Gaza, we're not going to win anything anyway. Was there any resentment to him then, to, from the other players? No, not at all, because we love Gaza, because Gaza is, you know, you know, it's like, listen, when we're all young at school and there's an idiot doing stupid things, and you want him to do stupid things, and I feel really, I feel a little bad now and responsible because, you know, we would always get Gaza to do stupid things. You know, if we're here now, and it's got a bit quiet and boring. I hope it's not. Or even if it's not, you know, you'd be going, oh, God, so God. And, and, he, and he would do something. <laughs> you can see, and he would do something. So um, we never resented him because he didn't do it an arrogant way. And you know there's something wrong with him. So, you know, he's, got, he's on a spectrum, Gaza. So if he was doing it to be arrogant or to show off, he doesn't do it to show off. He just does it because he can't help himself. I remember here at Tottenham, we were playing against, we were playing in a game here. Maradona was a charity match. And, and the television, because it was, it was a charity match. And, you know, when you do a charity match, and it's all about the television. Yeah, so it's all about the television. And not even the referee can say when to kick off. You know, you have the, the floor manager, and he's on the pitch there with the camera, and he's going, right, countdown to kick off, 10, 9. And, you know, it's all, what's it, you just want to play. And then you've got to wait for the television. It's come back to the adverts. And then he's going, like, you got five, four. And they're going, five, four. And you've got to kick off at that time. And you see the floor manager right by the ball, just about to kick off. And Gadget just went, as he heard him counting down, he just picked the ball up and just kicked it over the stand. And he went, <laughs> three seconds, bleh, and we went, there's no ball. <laughs> and we're going. And then Gaza, because he's impulsive, he then gets embarrassed. So he didn't, because he does things that he doesn't know why he does it. So you then go, look at him, and he just go. <laughs> Gaza does things that, because he's so impulsive. I'll have to tell you another guy's story now. For some reason, I'm driving Seven Sisters Road, I don't know Seven Sisters Road. He was driving with Jimmy, his mate, and, and, he was, and he's telling me this story because he cannot help himself. He was a really hot day. He goes, it's really hot, and I'm driving down the road. And he goes, I had an ice cream cone. And he goes, I'm driving down the road, you know, driving down there. He goes, he's a cyclist, and he's like cycling shorts. He goes, I'll pull up alongside him, and I just push the ice cream in his air, right? <laughs> So he's pushing the ice cream in his air, and he goes, it's in his air now, dribbling down, and I said, we just drove away laughing, right? And he goes, as we're driving away laughing, he goes, he's now chasing him. So he's looking at the rear mirror, and it's like, he's like that, and the ice cream cone was still sticking out of his air, right, to the dribbling out his face. So he goes, uh, drive on, drive on. So they're driving away, the geezer's chasing him, but it comes to the red light. Now the light's red, and he's coming up right behind him, and he's going, and he's going, <laughs> and he's coming now behind him, and he's saying to him, drive through, and he goes, I can't, because the light's red, so he stopped off, and he goes, the funniest thing about it, and I guess I tell the story, it's really funny. He was so angry, he was a cyclist on a proper racing bike, ice cream out of his air, yeah? <laughs> Crazy, and as he stopped now behind Gaza, he's so angry that he's forgot that he's got his toe clips in the bike. So as he stopped, he can't get his feet out, so he's just falling out, right? So he goes, and Gaza says, he got out of his clips, he's coming, he's banging on the door, and Gaza says, I started to cry, I'm going, I'm sorry, mate, I'm sorry, I don't know why I did it. And then they drove off, and he went, ah, oh, fuck off. <laughs> How can you not love Gaza? Thanks for watching this video, and if you found it helpful, and if you now find yourself thinking, I wonder what else this person can help me with, head over to paulgoff.com forward slash books where you can find my best selling books which will show you how to add more profit to your practice. Or send an email to paul at paulgoff.com to ask about how we can help you accelerate the growth and profitability of your clinic. And by the way, if you know anybody who would find this helpful, please share this video out. Thanks so much.